All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to get started on time so that we can end by 9.30. Um, all right, that, that's what time you're expecting to end by, 9.30? The teens are like, what? No, we'll be done by 8 or so. Uh, but I would like, what I would like you to do as I'm teaching through this uh, issue of encountering atheists and skeptics is think about and maybe even jot down a couple things questions about what I'm, ask, what I'm teaching on here regarding atheists and skeptics, or questions about anything apologetically, uh, think about what's the, what's the question you fear most that unbelievers going to ask you. That's always a good one. What am I most afraid that someone's going to throw at me as a challenge? Let's try to answer those. And then we'll, we'll take time at the end. Uh, to answer those questions as best we can. And I think, is there food planned for after this? Okay. And I'd be glad to stay around as long as you want and talk and answer questions and uh, whatever I can that way. For those of you that weren't here this morning, there's a book table out there. You can get most of those books for the same price on Amazon, but if you'd like to walk away with one in your hand, um, then I encourage you to, to do that. I can take credit card or cash. I basically sell them for the cost that it takes me to get the books, pay for shipping, and then bring them here. Uh, the most basic book of all, if you just say, give me something to uh, begin to learn apologetics, it's that book, Tactics, with the checkerboard on the front, black and white t checkerboard. That's the best basic book. All right, let's start with a word of prayer, and we'll dive right in. Father, I thank you so much for the power of the gospel, for the truth of the Christian faith rooted in history, for the fact that our faith is not merely wishful thinking, for the fact that we don't simply trust in something because it makes us feel good, but it is true. And uh, Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, and we do not need to fear when we encounter people who reject Christ because you have given us the power uh, to give an answer in such a way that convinces and persuades them. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about atheists and skeptics uh, because atheism and skepticism is on the rise. Now, you often hear statistics that say atheism and skepticism is on the rise, and it is. But that doesn't mean that religion is, is in decline. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio because... There are actually three classifications of people in the United States. There are atheists and skeptics. There are uh, nominal religious people. That is, they claim a religion. They don't really practice it or believe it. And then there are uh, faithful religious adherents. And what's happening is the, um, the faithful religious adherents and the skeptics are both on the rise, and the nominal religious people are bo plummeting, bottoming out. Very few people are left anymore in denominations that don't really believe what they say they believe anymore. People are leaving them by droves. But those who genuinely believe are on the rise, and skepticism is also on the rise. Notice the first point there on the handout, that there's really only four major worldviews in our world today. Monotheism, that is a belief in one God. So Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, they all believe in one God. Although, obviously, as Christians, we believe in distinctions in the Godhead, so our God is not the same as the God of those other religions. There's pantheism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Shinto, Zoroastrianism, where you have multiple gods, deities, spirits, and then basically two kinds of atheism or skepticism. So we're going to look at those. So let's look, first of all, at materialism or material naturalism. What is it? So notice, first of all, it says that all things ultimately can be reduced to material process or material phenomenon. That is, the only thing that exists are physical objects in the world. No such thing as the spiritual. No such thing as the soul or the real you. You are just your body. This world is just what it is physically. There's nothing more than that. The famous Christ, uh, atheist Christ, Christopher Hitchens, when he was dying a few years ago of brain cancer, uh, got mad at his doctors because they kept saying, your body's doing this, your body's doing that. And he kept saying, stop saying that. I am my body. Just say, you are doing this, you are doing that. Because in his mind, there was no soul. He was just his body. 
and his, his personality, his consciousness, was just the natural process of things happening in his brain. So material naturalists say the only things that exist are physical material objects in the world. They would also say then only scientifically verifiable statements can be considered knowledge. That is, you cannot claim anything is true or that you know it unless it is scientifically proven. That's what they would want to argue. And this is why if you meet atheists or skeptic, skeptics, what they'll often say is something like, uh, prove God exists to me, and then I'll believe in him. And what I mean by that is show me physical evidence that God exists. Show me in some way I can verify by science that God exists. So here's how I typically respond. And we'll learn about this tomorrow morning. How do you respond in actual conversation with unbelievers? I just begin asking strategic questions. So what would it take to prove God exists to you? Now, that's not original with me, but the first time I heard it, I thought, that's brilliant. Someone says, prove God exists. We ought to respond with, what would it take? And I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I've never thought about that before. I don't know what I would want God to do. Um, many people, however, will say, well, I would want God to appear before me. I always say, I'm so glad you said that. Now, let me ask you another question. What would he look like and what would he say to you that would absolutely convince you immediately that he was God? Because you said God has to prove himself to you. So what would he look like? Would a bright, shining light be enough? Well, no, I might be having a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. True. Uh, you know, what if you had a, a vision of God? Well, I might think I had really bad chilies on my pizza the night before or nuclear wings or something like that and have a, a bad vision. Uh, a lot of people would say, I don't know what I would want God to do. And that's why I'm pressing back on them on this whole idea of proving it because many people oppose God because they say there's no proof, but they can't even think of what it would take. A lot of people will then say, well, I would want God to appear to me in some way and do something so that I would know that he was God. And I say, I'm so glad you said that. Can I tell you about how God did that? Lived on the world, on the earth for 33 years and did numerous signs. Can I show you in the Gospels who Jesus is? And we go right from this impossible challenge of prove God exists right down to, can I open the Bible and show you who Jesus is? And if they object, I say, no, wait a second. You said you wanted God to appear invisible bodily form, and to perform miracles. Well, that's exactly what I'm pointing to. Um, and I have found time and time again that people either at that point have to be honest, like my atheist friend in Lancaster, co-founder of the Pennsylvania Skeptics Conference, will say, nothing you show me could prove God exists. And then I say, thank you for being honest, but that then shows that you are not a fair-minded, scientifically-minded person. You have a religion, and your religion is atheism, and nothing is going to dissuade you from that. Uh, in other words, we as Christians, we have good reason to believe what we believe because what our faith is centered in, the person and coming of Jesus, his death and resurrection, are all rooted in history. And there's mountains of historical evidence that lead us to believe that. We'll talk about that tomorrow morning. But turn to John chapter 6 if you have your Bibles. I want to show you the difference between what the world demands, what skeptics demand, and what God says we need to um, accept in order to know something. In John chapter 6, says the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And after he fed the 5,000, the people realize, we can get free lunch anytime with this guy. Let's just follow him around. I wish Jesus had fed them chicken and bread so we could say he fed them Chick-fil-A. That would make sense. Chick-fil-A is heavenly. There's no calories in it. I don't know how they do that. And angels lower it down to the restaurant each day. But uh, he fed them fish fillet sandwiches. Not quite as exciting. But after he fed them, you think about the condition of the average person in Palestine. The average working person lived day by day. You think in Jesus' parables where he, the landowner hires uh, hourly or daily wage earners. In other words, you hoped as a man working, or if you were a single mom or something, you hoped that you could earn enough to feed your family for that day or the next day. Jesus comes along and gives free lunch, as much as you could eat. It was like Shady, anybody ever been to Lancaster County and eat Shady Maple Buffet? Woo! 
Can I tell you, people who live in Lancaster County do not eat there because we would all die quickly of cholesterol or something like that. But it's an amazing place to visit. A buffet table about 100 yards long and everything you can imagine. So Jesus feeds these people. They begin to follow him around. And Jesus, we're told in John 6, knows the heart of people. And he says, don't seek after the bread that perishes. Don't seek after your immediate needs being satisfied. Seek after the eternal bread. And they're like, who, who does he think he is telling us, you know, what we should seek after? And they say, well, our father Moses gave us manna in the wilderness. And they were referring to their ancestors in the Old Testament. And Jesus says, Moses didn't give you that bread. I gave you that bread. I am the living bread. And they're like, whoa, time out. We know where you come from. You, you haven't been around since the time of Moses. And Jesus increasingly begins to say things that are harder and harder for them to believe until finally he drops the bomb on them. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. They're like, we're out of here. This is too weird. Cannibalism. It's getting freaky. We're out of here. In John chapter 6, in other words, what they were saying to Jesus is, you need to prove yourself every day to me through this tangible sign of bringing me food, making food for me. And notice what Jesus says in John 6:66. 6, That's a dangerous verse to read, John 6:66. 6, 6, 6. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, "Do you want to go away as well?" Simon Peter answered him, "Lord, to whom shall we go?" You have the words of eternal life. And now notice the next verse. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Here's the difference. Atheists and skeptics say, I must know, I must know it before I'll believe it. God says, you will never know it until you believe it. Think about the difference there. Now, God never calls us, just trust me, just trust me. No, God calls us to believe in the revelation that he's given. The gospel is the message that Jesus came at a certain point in history, and he lived and he died and he rose again. And the Bible records that, and we are required to believe on the basis of the testimony of the scriptures. And only when you believe in Christ do you actually come to know him. It'd be like, let's say, uh, before I was married, I said to my wife, because we dated since we were in high school, Let's say I said to her, when I feel I fully know you, absolutely 100% know you all the way through, then we'll get married. What would happen? You, you cannot know someone like that until you get married. In other words, you have to believe or commit first in order to know. So when you're dealing with an atheist or skeptic, they have this mistaken notion that until I can fully understand God and I have 100% scientific proof, then I will believe, but it doesn't work that way. By the way, we'll look into science in just a moment. Nothing, zero, nothing in science is known 100% for sure. The more I read about science and real scientists and not the atheistic version of scientists, they talk about the fact that their calculations, their guesses, their estimates is basically how science is done. We calculate to imagine, okay, it must be this way, but we're always refining it and changing it. Notice letter C then, if this is true that the only things that exist in the world are physical, material realities, nothing that you love or hate or desire has any meaning whatsoever. Think about this. The materialist says uh, there is no real you, there's no soul, and everything that you love and hate and desire is merely the functioning of your brain. You are the genetic code. You are a machine, and you do what your genetic code tells you to do. So if you love kittens and babies and kindness and generosity, it's just because you're programmed to. And if you love violence and cruelty and aggression, it's just because you're programmed to. Now, here's the problem with that. That is the logical outcome of materialism. But every person in the world, because we're made in the image of God, we intuitively think that's not right. Because if what the materialists say are true, we can't condemn people who choose a path of aggression, cruelty, murder, genocide, serial killing, because they're just programmed to do it. How can we condemn them? They're just carrying out what their genes tell them to do. And something inside of us intuitively says, that's not right. 
It can't be right. Why? Because we're made in the image of God and we cannot deny that. But if you believe in material naturalism, atheism, where all you are is the product of your genes, you cannot condemn someone who does a heinous, evil act causing suffering on other people because they're just carrying out what they are in their makeup. So here's some examples of people like this. Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, Peter Atkins. These are scientific atheists, even though their so-called science is not really science. By the way, I, I teach a class in um, advanced apologetics at the college, and we talk about the fraud in science. We talk about recent articles that say 400,000 studies around the world and peer-reviewed scientific journals have been shown to be fraudulent. Nature Magazine, one of the top science magazines in the world, says there's a growing problem of people fraudulently um, producing scientific studies to get funding, and uh, it's fraudulent. Now, this is not to put down science. Science is a wonder. God. But materialism basically says science is God. And that's a problem because the natural world is not designed to work at that level. So what's wrong with this viewpoint? Number one, it cannot prove its own basic principle by its own criteria. So let me do a little philosophy here just for a second. If we put the, this claim to the test, to its own test, it would mean that this principle, that the only thing that exists are, science, are material objects, should be a material object. In other words, if this is true, then this statement, we ought to be able to find it, this idea, we ought to be able to find it under a rock or in a jungle somewhere or by looking through a telescope or a microscope. We ought to be able to see it, but it's, you can't. It's not a physical object. It's a belief. It's a value, and those things are not physical, which means if this statement is true, then it's false, and if it's false, it's false. It's called a self-defeating argument. So people that argue this are basically jumping forward and saying, don't pay attention to that right there. Kind of like in Wizard of Oz, when Toto pulls the curtain back. How many of you teens have ever even seen Wizard of Oz? It was the stuff of nightmares for us people in the 20th century, old, old people. Basically, Toto pulls back the curtain and reveals the Wizard of Oz as just a little old man, you know, pulling levers and pushing buttons. He was nothing to be afraid of. And when you get atheistic materialists in the, in the mix, they try to basically say, don't look at my presuppositions that everything is physical. Don't look behind there. Let's just move forward. And the problem is what they're arguing is basically a philosophical or religious commitment. Secondly, it's not true science, but what we call scientism. C.S. Lewis was one of the first to coin this term. And he meant by it the misuse of science into a religion. It's the belief that science is the sole arbiter of truth in the modern world. So there's a couple of books out there on the table. One is Can Science Explain Everything? Written by an Oxford mathematician, John Lennox, who's a wonderful Christian apologist. He's an Irishman. He's a big old fat guy. Um, and he's the most delightful looking guy with this little accent in it. And he wrecks atheists in debates. And so he wrote this little book, says, and the, the title again is, Can Science Explain Everything? He says, no, of course not. Science is very limited. It's useful. It's a blessing. But it can't answer everything. There's also a book out there called Scientism and Secularism by J.P. Moreland, a Christian philosopher. And he talks about this distortion of science. Thirdly, letter C, the conflict is not between science and religion, as we're often told, but between science and naturalism. That is, the more this philosophy creeps into the doing of science, the more science is corrupted. And there's a major revolution going on in science right now where many top philosophers of science are saying Darwin's idea fails today in the world of DNA and genetics. It doesn't work. We need to rethink evolution. They're not necessarily giving up evolution, but they're saying this paradigm that we said for 150 years was the truth, it doesn't work anymore. We know too much now. In other words, they're saying there's all this fraud that was committed in science trying to prove Darwinism that we can no longer hold to. By the way, let's take a look at some limitations of science. First of all, science 
can only address the natural world. So think about it. There's, there's two realms of existence. There's the natural world. There's this pulpit, your body, um, all the physical things in the air, including the air and the atmosphere. And then there's the immaterial. There's your soul. There's things like love and justice and logic, which are not physical objects. Science, admittedly, the definition of science is the exploration through the process of induction of the natural world. So to turn around and say, uh, as a, I'm not a scientist, but if a scientist were to say the material world, the physical world is the only thing that exists, they're not able to say whether anything else exists. It's kind of like if you can only see black and white and everybody else around you sees color and you argue with them all the time that there's no such thing as color, What's the problem? Are they deluded or are you deluded? You are because you are limited. You can only see two colors. And the problem with science is it tries to tell us beyond the natural world that it's equipped to tell us about and tries to tell us about the immaterial world. Secondly, all scientific data has to be interpreted. Whenever someone says, oh, this new scientific discovery disproves Christianity, it's not possible. Because whatever a scientist finds, water is made of H2O. He then has to interpret it. Did this come about through t random time and chance over billions of years, or was there a designer who created it? So the, oops, the Christian and the unbelieving scientist can agree on the facts, but when they interpret it, they're going to differ. And that's where our argument should take place, is what's the best interpretation of the scientific data? Thirdly, Science must constantly revise and rescind its pronouncements. The problem with arguing that science gives us all the answers is that scientific pronouncements change all the time. There's very few things that don't change. Things like gravity and the laws of therm thermodynamics, those don't change. But think about even in the field of nutrition science. So um, a number of years ago, if you go back and look at advertisements uh, from the 1960s and 70s that were in magazines, it was, they were advertisements endorsed by scientists that were paid by the sugar industry. And the advertisement said something like this, make sure your child gets his two cups of sugar a day to keep him happy and healthy. Like today, we look back at that and say, are you kidding, two cups of sugar? I mean. I myself can knock down an entire box of sugared cereal still, but that's coming to an end soon. Any teenagers, you can do that, teenage boys? Yeah, if mom buys you one box of sugared cereal, it's like, mom, this is a snack. Where's the meal? But if, if you go on Netflix and watch the documentary Sugar Coated, it talks about how scientists were bought by the sugar industry to produce these studies that said we need lots of sugar in our diet. A few years ago, I think it was in the... Late 90s, oats were going to save us all. Do you remember that? Oatmeal and Cheerios and the price of oats and the stock of oats went up and up and up. And then after a little while, they said, well, oats are good for you, but it's not going to cure cancer. It's not going to, you know, save heart attacks. And when they were honest about it, they said this, you know, could lower your cholesterol 2%. Well, most of us with a cholesterol problem have way more than 2% to, uh, to deal with, don't we? And then a couple of years ago, it was kale, right? Kale was going to save us all. Um, do you know before the kale craze, the largest purchaser of kale in the United States was Pizza Hut? And you know what they did with it? They decorated their pizza bar with it. And then we were told, kale is good for you. It will cure all your ills. And suddenly the price of kale went up. And if you were a kale farmer, you were making kale chips and kale smoothies and Kale sandwiches, and I don't know what else, but... And now they're saying, well, kale is good for you, but it's not going to solve your problem. Well, this happens in science across the board. People are always having to change and modify their discoveries. So if science gives us all the answer, my question when people say they just believe in science, I say, which scientists? Which field of science? Because scientists do not all agree on various things. Here's another one. Science is always done by finite, that means limited, flawed, and biased people. When people say they trust in science, 
they imagine that somehow becoming a scientist magically makes you lose all self-interest, all personal um, ambition. But there's also a growing problem in science. Again, Nature Magazine a few months ago put out this study that said that one of the real problems in, in the scientific community is everyone's trying to one-up one another, gain funding, uh, make a name for themselves, put other scientists down so they become more well-known. If that's how science is done, how can we trust it to be 100% true? Here's another one. Science must be funded. That is, you don't do science for free. You know, those machines that they use are very expensive. So many times science is done by those who can write the most convincing grant proposals, not always to do the most important science, but money influences science. And then lastly, scientists disagree all the time about all kinds of things. So my, my intent here is not to ruin your view of science. As I said, it is a gift from God. If you're scientifically minded, God can use you to make great discovery, important discoveries in various areas. The problem is when it's claimed that science can give us all the answers, it's simply beyond what science can really do. Notice also then, if everything we think is the result of random brain activity, that's what materialists would say, everything you do is just your brain functioning randomly, why would we think that this theory is anything more than random brain activity? Think about that. Materialists would say everything you think is just random brain activity doesn't mean anything. Then this theory would be random brain activity and doesn't mean anything. But notice when they say this, they say, well, yes, everything you do is random brain activity, but my work as a scientist, as a philosopher, we really understand the truth. But all you unwashed masses, you're just random brain activity. Do you see the hypocrisy there? Scientists are just human beings. And some of them are good and objective and are willing to go wherever the evidence leads. And many others are guided by their personal ambition, their bias, their flawed nature. Notice lastly then, natural selection, the fundamental principle of Darwinian evolution, that nature selects the most fittest of all things. It's all about the appropriate behavior for survival. That is, it's supposed to help us survive, not for the discovery of truth. So when they say science is the only path to truth, I would say, wait a minute, that's not what your scientific theory says. Your scientific theory says uh, science helps us to learn how to survive, not to find truth. And now they're adding on to that science helps human flourishing. Well, science can help human flourishing, but it doesn't always necessarily. So the fundamental problem with this form of skepticism is its overconfidence in science Rather than recognizing science as a limited, useful way to study our world, they see it as all-encompassing. Notice on the back side of the handout, though, there's another kind of atheist or skeptic you might come across. And the way you tell, by the way, anyone's belief is you simply ask them, what's your religious background? What do you believe about the world, about God? Uh, most of the time I let people talk. So I started to have a conversation with the innkeeper where I'm staying this afternoon. And uh, she said, so what are you doing here? And I told her, I said, I'm here to give a conference on the historical and philosophical arguments for the reliability of Christianity. And she looked at me, she goes, oh, okay. Well, I'm Catholic, but I don't really go to church. And I married a guy who's not a Christian or he doesn't believe in God. But, you know, I try to be a good person. I'm really sorry for just swearing. Right before I told her that, she swore. I said, don't, you don't have to apologize to me. I said, so, so how did you become a Catholic? We started to talk. She was cut off in the middle of our discussion and had to go take care of something. But ask people. So if they say I'm an atheist, I always get excited because I find atheism to be so fascinating. I always say, oh, really? So, so what led you to become an atheist? A lot of Christians have the, uh, the wrong idea that all atheists have been hurt by someone. That's why they don't believe in God. It's not true. Some of them have. But the atheist that I invite into my class at Lancaster Bible College at the end of the semester, he tells the students, I became an atheist by reading the Bible. In other words, he said, I was in college. He'd been raised in some religion. 
or some denomination. And he said, I decided to read the Bible for myself. And I was so appalled at what I read in there that I said, I couldn't believe in this God. And that's how I became an atheist. Sometimes people become an atheist because they just want to live the way they want to live. In other words, there's all kinds of reasons. So always ask, so why are you an atheist? What kind of atheist are you? Ask questions, and the more they talk, the more you'll see where to go with the conversation. So here's a different kind of atheism, secular humanism. These are the atheists that are not really focused on science, but rather on human progress. So they place faith solely in human reason as the bedrock and human reason upon which to build a progressive society morally, culturally, and intellectually. So they're all about reason. These are the people who often think of themselves as very smart, and many times they are very smart. And yet they're not so much focused on science as the ability of humans to solve their old problems without God. Notice letter B, human reason is sufficiently reliable, they would say, and just, they bring sneak this idea of moral value, justice into it, to guide the course of lives, individually and collectively, without any consideration of God or divine authority. That is basically, they say, we don't need God in our world. We can form a society on our own. Letter C, since reason ought to guide our lives, oh, here's a quote by John Lennon. Christianity will go. He wrote this about 50 years ago, or said about 50 years ago, from the Beatles, in case people don't know who the Beatles are, John Lennon. Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. That's the most anti-intellectual thing anyone ever says. I don't have to argue about it. Well, then you are more religious than me, because I have arguments for why I believe what I believe. I needn't argue about it. I'm right and will be proved right. And every major sociologist today would say, yep, that's what we believed 50 years ago, and we've been proven conclusively wrong. Every major sociologist would say, that's what we thought would happen, but it's not happened. Christianity is flourishing around the world. Uh, and not just Christianity, but other religions too. But Christianity itself is flourishing in many parts of the world. So John Lennon is wrong, and uh, sadly, now he knows that he's wrong. Letter C, since human reason ought to guide our lives, religion must be kept out of the public sphere because of its very nature. One of the things my skeptic friend does is he spends time in Harrisburg, our state capital, lobbying against Christians having a voice in politics. So as a secular humanist, he's always arguing to lawmakers, you can't take religious considerations into being um, I, I challenge him sometimes. I said, so do you argue that about Muslims too? Strangely, he doesn't. I wonder why. He's like, no, no, well, Christianity is a major religion here, so that's what I'm fighting against. But secular humanists don't want, that's, that's why we have um, organizations like um, Freedom From Religion Foundation, the ACLU, others. They don't want Christians to have a voice in society in protecting the lives of the unborn, in passing laws that protect personal freedoms and bring about justice. They would argue human reason is the instrument and servant of the will. That is, we can choose as a society what we want our values to be. So we can choose to be good and just without God because it's all about what we will to be true. Letter E, religion causes evil in the world through oppression, intolerance, and bigotry. There's an act uh, called the Equality Act being proposed right now, I think in Congress, that would basically make it a crime to disagree with um, LGBTQ issues, to oppose um, any legislation which would allow more abortion, Basically, the Equality Act basically shuts down every attempt to oppose where the culture is going. It's a very dangerous act. Unfortunately, it hasn't gained much ground yet, but it is being proposed in our Congress. It would have widespread consequence. And many people in our world think that religion causes this. And uh, this is a key apologetic point. Uh, that is true, that religion does cause that throughout the world, but so does atheism. Right? 
The 20th century is the monument to what happens with governments that are atheistic. Fascist Germany, Nazi Germany, Communist Russia, Communist China, Communist Cambodia, where those in power, Pol Pot, the dictator, killed one-third of the people in his nation. Every three people you know, killed. Anybody who wore glasses in Cambodia was put to death because they were assumed to be educated. Pol Pot drove people out of the cities into the country, made everyone wear the same clothes, dress the same, be farmers, and it led to mass starvation in Cambodia. Uh, those of us who are a little bit older remember the Cambodian refugees of the 80s and 90s as a result of communism. So religion does cause this, but I'm not, when, I'm, when I'm talking with a non-believer, I'm not arguing for religion. Don't get stuck in that. I'm arguing for Christianity. I'm arguing for Jesus. I'm trying to present a case for the truth of Jesus Christ. I do not want to account for religion. Religion has caused great suffering. And so don't fall into the trap of defending religion. Defend Christianity. Notice Marxist versions of... Oh, the Marxist version says, by overthrowing the upper class in ideal society without greed and competition would emerge. This is what Marx, Karl Marx taught. If we could do away with private property, private ownership, things like that, get rid of religion, then greed would disappear, competition would disappear. And I went to Russia in the, in the late 90s after communism fell. It was a culture destroyed, basically, and they struggle even to this day to get back to that. Here's some examples. Christopher Hitchens, the... Uh, essayist and, and journalist who has now passed on. Uh, go and read the Secular Humanist Manifestos. Very interesting, very anti-Christian. So what's wrong with secular humanism? If human reason is the instrument and servant of the will, it is under no obligation to choose the path of mercy, sympathy, or peace. So my skeptic friend, um, Whenever he's asked, like, where do you get your morals from, he kind of gets a little hot under the collar, and he says, you know, Christians always think atheists are just immoral people, dishonest people. And I always say, listen, I don't think that of you. I, I'm sure you, you know, I have no doubt that you are a moral and honest person, but those statements, moral and honest, only make sense in a Christian worldview. Those are Christian values. In an atheistic world, there's no such thing as a universal value, as a universal right. So by calling yourself honest, you're borrowing a Christian idea to evaluate yourself. Because think about it, in a Darwinian natural world of evolution, um, out in the savanna when the lion kills the zebra, do you think all the zebras gather around and say, that was wrong, you shouldn't have done that. And the other lion's like, dude, you shouldn't have killed that zebra, that was really cruel and vicious. No. Because in nature, nature, you've heard the statement before, is red in tooth and claw. Nature's all about killing and eating, right? So if that's all we are, then I have no obligation to choose a path of mercy, sympathy, and peace. My skeptic friend says, uh, empathy should guide our society. That is, we should each be kind and nice to one another. We should look out for one another. And I remind him, if there is no God, that's one choice but so is cruelty and aggression. In other words, if there's no God, you can't tell me cruelty and aggression is bad because there's no morals. And if I choose the path of cruelty and aggression, I hope you choose the path of kindness because it will be all that much easier to take advantage of you. But here's the problem is most atheists and skeptics don't live that way. They try to be good and moral people even though there's no morality in atheism which shows that they cannot escape the fact that they're made in the image of God and their intuition is to try to be good even though they deny there is such a thing as good. Here's another objection. Some of the most sweeping social transformations in our world have begun from the conviction of the truth of Christianity. That is, atheists and skeptics think Christians are so bad for the world, but think about William Wilberforce in Britain who spent his whole life fighting against the slave trade. Think about Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement. My friend, who this, this guy who always is arguing that Christians have no place in the public square, I said, would you be willing to talk to some of my uh, black pastor friends about that? 
that, that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. should never have quoted scripture in the civil rights movement. He's not willing to do that because he doesn't want to argue that because Martin Luther King Jr., uh, his whole efforts for the civil rights movement was grounded in this idea of justice in scripture. So he doesn't want to touch that. He only wants to touch modern day Christian issues, but it's a contradiction. Notice also, um, Marxism resulted in unprecedented poverty in our world, government oppression, dehumanization, genocide, totalitarianism. In other words, Karl Marx said if we would do away with Christianity, then greed would disappear, corruption would disappear, competition would disappear, and what happened in World War II? The death of more than 100 million people between communism, fascism, Russia, China, Cambodia. In other words, it didn't eliminate greed. Rather, it gave those in power absolute power. And then finally, humanists can never seem to come to any agreement on anything without the use of power to enforce the opinion of certain humanists. So uh, increasingly, humanists, atheists, the LGBTQ um, agenda and community are using what? Legal force to make people do things that, they are, that are against their religious convictions. Um, they are trying to use political power to pass this Equality Act, which would basically silence Christians in society. Uh, they used political power in New York a few months ago when they voted to allow abortion all the way up through the uh, final trimester of pregnancy. Uh, they used it in Virginia. The Virginia governor tried to uh, propose a law that would allow, even after a baby was born, for the doctor and the mother to have the choice to kill the baby. He said it live on radio. In other words, they use the political power to enforce their position while they oppose all the time Christians trying to influence their culture. So this is the problem with secular humanism. So then how do we engage atheists and skeptics? Number one, don't be intimidated. I find a lot of Christians are like, okay, I, I can engage this person, this person, but atheists, Mark, what should we do? Should we hunker down and just hide? You know, wait till they walk by? No, atheists are some of the easiest people to engage about the gospel because they're primed. Their whole world is about denying God's existence. So Talk to them. Ask them why they're atheists. Ask them what they believe. And as we'll learn tomorrow morning, we can begin to point out contradictions in their belief system. We can point out the fact that what they argue, they can't really live out. My skeptic friend doesn't believe in right and wrong. He says, no such thing as good and evil. So I asked him, I said, are you saying, he has two small kids, that if someone broke into your house and came after your wife and kids and did something horrendous to them, you couldn't say that was wrong? He said, well, we as society have learned that's not helpful for human flourishing, but I couldn't say that it was morally wrong. I wanted to say, you're a liar. Everything in you would know that was wrong. Uh, so it's, we have to be careful. Don't, don't be intimidated by these people. They love to intimidate. I've got a couple of assistants in my apologetics ministry that were uh, atheists in high school. In fact, there were four of them, all good friends in high school over in Allentown, Pennsylvania. They were atheists till their junior year of high school, and uh, they all came to Christ at the same time. They're all pursuing pastoral ministry and counseling ministry and things like that now. And they tell me, when we were in high school, we loved to intimidate the Christians. You know, we'd be like, ah, you know, and get tattoos. And uh, the one guy who's now um, preparing to go on to Cambridge University to study the New Testament. He had huge gauges in his ear and tattoos and wore dark clothing. He's totally different now. Uh, we have a professor at LBC that was an atheist in college, and they say, don't be intimidated. Um, they love to do that. But as Christians, we're called. We've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Secondly, remember that they are more actively suppressing the truth of God than any other kind of unbeliever. For the second or the first session this morning, we talked about the fact that God says in Romans 1, every unbeliever knows God and is suppressing the truth of God, pushing down, holding down the knowledge of God that rises in them every day. 
Well, one of the things that happens when people do that is they either have to turn to another religion, and that's why religions exist in the world, because people turn to worship something. But an atheist is a person who's trying to deny that they even worship anything. So they're the ones who are most unsteadily trying to hold down the knowledge of God. So engage them because they're trying to pretend like they don't worship when it's very obvious that even atheists and skeptics worship something. They worship science, they worship their own mind, they worship human reason, and a few questions can reveal that. Challenge them with the verified history of the Gospels and the life of Jesus, not some vague notion of God. Here's a key. When you talk to unbelievers, don't let the conversation get stuck on God because the concept of God is too vague. Jesus tells us, I have come that you might know the Father. Remember Philip, after he'd been with Jesus for several years, he finally says, all right, Jesus, we've been with you all this time. Would you please just show us the Father? Show us who God is. And Jesus is like, Philip, haven't I been with you so long? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am God. Come in the flesh to show you who God is. So when I talk to people, I try to move away from the concept of God because it's too vague and there's too many philosophical objections. I want to get them into Jesus. Do you know who Jesus is, what he said, what he claimed? As we'll see tomorrow morning when we get to the resurrection, that's the sticking point. A lot of people believe Jesus was a good man. A lot of people believe that he existed. But I want to press them on the claims. Do you know that Jesus claimed that he was God? Do you believe that? Well, no. Okay, well then don't say you believe in Jesus. Don't say you believe he was a good person because he claimed that. He also said if you rejected him that you would go to hell and spend eternity separated from him. Do you believe that? Of course not. Well then... You should hate Jesus. That would be consistent. But instead, people try to admire a form of Jesus that is simply intellectually dishonest, that's not consistent with what the Bible says about Jesus. So challenge them on Jesus. And finally, challenge them to present a rational case for morals and justice in an atheistic world. It is not possible... I'm not really a scientifically minded person. I'm a philosopher, if anything. Philosophers have been trying for hundreds and hundreds of years to present a case for there being a right and wrong that can apply to all people that we can know. They cannot do it. Atheists cannot come up with an argument for there being right and wrong. They have to borrow Christian ideas. Okay. So that's, I just backed the truck up and dumped it on you. And you're probably thinking, I need to swim to the surface before anything else can happen. But let's take questions now for the next 10, 15 minutes or so about this or anything. I'm willing to entertain any question. And as I did this morning, if you ask me something I don't want to answer, I'll just say, ask your pastor. That's his job. Questions? Wow, this is like teaching college where the students just want me to dismiss them. And they're all thinking, nobody ask a question. I'm not going to dismiss you for at least 10 minutes. So, yes. Hold on just a second. Just a second. Oh, okay. We want to use the microphone so we can record it. What do you think of the, of the question, what kind of God do, don't you believe in? That's a good question. Yeah, if an atheist says they don't believe in God, I would say, yeah, what kind of God don't you believe in? It's a good question. The, the skeptic who was in my class this week, um, I always let the students pick the questions they want to ask, and one of them asked a really good question. They said, if, if there was a God, what would you want him to be like? I thought, that's a really good question. He said, well, he would be kind and loving and just and my response was, that, that's good, because God is all those things. But that just sounds like a projection of who you wish you were, or the best you. But that's kind of simplistic, because then people who do wrong would never get justice. And um, it's a good question. Someone else? I have two microphones. So teenagers, come on. Help me out here. Yes. Oh, you have to wait till you get the microphone. 
Thank you. What do you say to the person who says, um, well, what about all the other religions of the world? Oh, that's good. You're saying that you can only, you know, your Christianity is the only way. What about, you know, all the rest of the people in the world that believe in other gods? Yeah, good question. So what about all the other religions in the world? First question I asked, I asked them would be, well, what do the other religions teach? In other words, anybody ever play four square when you're in elementary school? It's a game in the playground with four squares. That's why the name is. And people bounce the ball into your square, and what do you have to do? You have to bounce it back. So when people ask that kind of question, I, I ask, so what, what do other religions teach? Or have you studied other religions? And most of the time they'd be like, well, no. Okay, so you're asking a question and you've not done any study. All right, then I'll say, um, well, do you know the difference between Christianity and other religions? In other words, ask another question. Um, and I would say, here's the difference. Christianity promises, based on a historical event, most religions are not based in history. Buddhism, Hinduism, for example, no one has any idea how they started. There's mythical ideas, but no one believes they're historically true. I would argue Christianity is rooted in a historical event for which there's strong uh, evidence and records for, but it also teaches a way to come to know uh, the God who created me uh, and to be reconciled to him apart from my own human effort. And I would say every other religion argues that you must do something and you can never know in this lifetime. So I would want to point out, do you see the difference between those things? Religions teach very different ideas. I would also point out the fact that um, um, Christianity is unique in the sense that Christianity claims God came down in the flesh and lived on this earth. Every other religion, their concept of God or the divine, whatever it might be, in Buddhism there is no God, it's the Brahma. Um, you can't really know those things, and yet God in Christianity has revealed himself so that we can actually know who he is. He's told us who he is, what he's like, what he demands of us. So I would point out the fact that, um, or ask the question, do you think that all religions are the same, or do you have an objection that there's only one way? And I would say that the other religions don't provide a way to know in this lifetime. Christianity does. So that would be one of my answers. It's a good question. Yes. Um, I've had someone say to me, uh, religion's something we develop just as a psychological crutch. I would say, yeah, that's, that's true. A lot of religions are that way. Yep. That's how a lot of religions started. But I would say I'm not defending religion. I'm actually arguing or making a case for Christianity. And uh, it's based on historical realities or historical events of Jesus coming. But I would also say, another response is, uh, atheism is also, skepticism is also a crutch for a lot of people so that they don't have to deal with things. And um, I would ask them, you know, uh, what, is, what is your crutch? And if they claim not to have one, I would try to demonstrate that they did. It's a good question. Other questions? Yes, over here and then in the back. A lot of people, it just seems like they haven't really thought of it or haven't really given much thought to it. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your buddy who said, I'm an atheist because I read the Bible yes. and how you engaged with him? That's good. So along with that, one of the things I always encourage Christians is if you want to defend your faith and you've never read this, then you are behind a lot of skeptics who have. So the first place to start is to realize God gave this to me. This is God's revelation. I need to read it. I need to know it. The best thing you can do is to know this. That will make you the best apologist possible. The problem with him, and or the reason why he became an atheist, is because when he read the Bible, he read it ignoring all the historical um, indicators, the literary indicators. So, for example, he reads the book of Judges, where we know the book of Judges, what does it tell us? In those days, there was no king in Israel, so every man did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, the book of Judges is this, is this horrendous, horrific record of the evils of the human heart carried out within a nation of who have rejected God. Well, when he read it, he read it as God approves this stuff. In other words, he ignored 
all the context, all the, the literature. Um, he looks at the Gospels and he sees myth. And part of the problem, too, is he's, he's not a well-schooled atheist. There are some challenges to the Christian faith historically. There are good answers, but there's real challenges. He doesn't know any of the good ones. He just says, I think the Bible's full of myths. Well, the problem is no historian who studies the Bible believes that's what the Bible is. Not even the unbelieving ones. They would say, we start with what the Bible tells because it's so reliable, and then we move from there. So that's part of the problem, and that's why when you're talking with an unbeliever, you've got to ask a lot of questions. A lot of times I'll just let people talk for the first 15, 20 minutes, asking questions, trying to figure out what are their main objections, what do they believe, and then I'll begin to give answers. If we jump too quickly, as we talked about this morning, give the gospel burp. Excuse me, sir, you know for sure if you died today, go to heaven. Can I tell you God loves you? But Jesus died on the cross for you, but you fall into sin. If you just believe in him, you can be saved. It's called the gospel burp because we feel better afterward and they're offended because you've just burped out all the information. If you take the time to ask questions and figure out what their objections are, because you might, you might have a totally wrong conception. You might think this, problem has, this person has all these arguments against Christianity. You answer one or two and they say, you know what? I'm not really interested in talking about this because if I become a Christian, I can't keep sleeping with my girlfriend. I can't keep, I can't keep getting wasted on the weekends and I don't want to give that up. And then you come to realize all these intellectual objections were just a smokescreen for not wanting to have God in their life, telling them what to do. So that, that's really important. With my skeptic friend, I've known him for about five years. Um, outwardly, I don't think I've made a dent. Because <laughs> he is, here's the interesting thing, he has never conceded a point. We go out for coffee sometimes. Most of the time when you talk with unbelievers and they say things, that are wrong, and you correct them, like, oh, thanks for telling me that. I didn't know that. He's never done that once. He's very invested in atheism. So if God ever saves him, he's going to have to basically admit the last 20 years of his life have been a total waste. And that's why it's the Holy Spirit that's got to change him, because no argument's going to win him. You've heard people say arguments don't win people to Christ. That's true. But without arguments, most people don't ever hear the truth of the gospel. And when, I, when we say arguments, we're not talking about arguing. We're talking about presenting a case. God has called us to present a case, but we should do that knowing that it's got to be the Holy Spirit who takes my words and uses that to change them. Does that answer the question? Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank you for um, all that I've learned today through you. And actually, my question was answered in your last few comments because... My concern or my issue is more with young adults who say they're Christians, mm. but they're not living a Christian life. And to me, they're more of an atheist than a Christian. But I, how do you, how do you, you know, because, oh, well, I, can't, you know, I have to love my, my um, neighbor who's, um, you know, gay. And I have mm -hmm. to, you know, how can you not do this? And, that? and I, I say, oh, well, yeah, you do love them. I do. But, but they don't see that what they're doing is wrong. And I, I have a lot of young adults in my life that I need some answers for. Okay. Yeah, first I'll say it's not just a problem with the young adults. It's a problem with many older adults too. I, I often say that it's not a generational thing, like you people are the problem. It's a Christians living in this world problem because there's plenty of people like my age that are doing the same thing. But I know what you mean. Um, we... It's so funny, the age divide here. I'm sure that was not intentional. But I, I do know that adults tend to avoid teens because they're scary, and teens tend to avoid adults because they're scary. So it's just safer to sit on your side of the auditorium. Oh, that's right, yeah. Sit in front of them, you can't see them. No. I, I love this generation. All the college students I teach are 18, 19, 20-year-olds. And, and you're right, um, many of them struggle with how do, we, how do they live in the world? Because I didn't have gay friends growing up, but most of these teens probably do. You go to school with homosexuals, with transgenders, lesbians, questioning, you know, the whole alphabet um, that follows LGBTQ. And they have to wrestle with how do I go to school, have friends like this, 
and still live my Christian testimony. And part of the problem is sometimes um, certain types of people are portrayed a certain way, and then they meet someone like that, right? And they're like, oh, I was told homosexuals are really mean to Christians, but my gay friend is so nice. My own kids struggled with that about 10 years ago when they were teenagers. Each one of them, when they turned 14, went to work at an assisted living center dining room. And they worked around unbelievers. And they would each come home at a certain point after they'd been there a short time and said, Dad, how do we know what we believe is true? I work with all these unbelievers and they're nice to me. My one daughter said, Dad, they're nicer than my Christian friends. And they wrestle with that because they hear how awful atheists are, how awful homosexuals and transgenders are. So we've got to help them see, okay, you should love them. And, and this group over here is better at having relationships with people that are far from Christ. Uh, it gets harder as you get older because adults have responsibilities that teenagers don't. I understand that. We've got to help them know that here's how you be friends with someone who lives a lifestyle that's contrary to God's word. And you love them and you show kindness, but you speak the truth because sin is destructive. This is the number one problem missing in American Christianity today. We no longer believe sin is destructive. We recognize it with some sins, drug addiction, alcoholism, divorce. But we tend not to believe that necessarily homosexuality is destructive. But it is destructive. Transgenderism is destructive. I follow a lot of the trends, and now they're pushing in certain countries for children as young as five to be able to choose surgery and hormonal treatment to change their gender at five. I see that as child abuse. I see that as having devastating consequences on the next generation. But we who are older have to help them say, yes, love this person, have a relationship with them, but show Christ. Be salt in the life of that person. Be bold, uh, which may mean at some point that that friend says, I'm tired of hearing about Jesus. I don't want to be friends with you anymore. You've got to be willing to walk away from a relationship if you're telling them about Jesus in a good way interferes with their lifestyle, we can't compromise on that. On the other hand, those of us on this side of the aisle, we've got to learn how to love and have relationships with people who are unbelievers, living destructive lifestyles, sometimes antagonistic to us, and still care enough for them about them and have relationships with them. So it's a great question. That's why out on the table out there, I've got three or four books on homosexuality, transgenderism, because as Christians, we need to be clear that any, any sexual activity outside of one man, one woman in marriage, which means I should oppose um, adultery and fornication as much as I do homosexuality. I should lift up godly sexuality to be exercised only in the covenantal agreement of marriage between one, one man and one woman for life. But I also need to be ready to embrace those who've been broken sexually to welcome them in when they repent and to encourage them to repent. And I need to also realize that people that might have homosexual or transgender desires could be struggling with a desire that they don't want. And I have to make a distinguishing, I have to distinguish between people that say I'm, I'm attracted to someone of the same sex as me but I don't want to live that way because I don't believe it's God's way, so help me to live a celibate way. And um, The one book out there by Rosaria Butterfield on, it's called Openness Unhindered. She says the solution to homosexuality is not heterosexuality. The solution to homosexuality is repentance and belief in Christ. And she says some people who have same-sex desires might never come to desire the opposite sex, but they can, le they can live holy and separate to God, celibate to God, uh, and live in obedience that way. So it's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. Because as a church, we need to talk more about this. Teens, you need to hear more about that. Those friends that you have, those people that you go to school with that are heading down the path of homosexuality or transgenderism, that sin is destructive and love them and uh, have relationships with them, but don't refrain, don't keep from speaking about Jesus with them because they need Christ uh, in order to be saved and to be restored. Long answer to a short question.
Yes. Yeah, I have a question about um, Jesus taught to shake the dust off our feet and move on. Oh, thank you. Something uh, easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how do you navigate through that? Mm. Where, what is your stopping point yeah. working with people? It's a good point. Um, it's never after the first rejection. Uh, so if you try to share the gospel with someone, they say, I don't want to hear it, then say, fine. I'm never talking to you again. Rather, um, when God puts people into our lives, we ought to continue to press the claims of the gospel whenever we can. But to realize at some point, if I'm investing so much time in a certain person getting nowhere, maybe I need to stop investing in that person uh, if I feel like it's going nowhere and just pray for them and say, okay, Lord, you're going to have to use someone else or something else to reach them. But I would say we, should be, we shouldn't give up easily. Uh, the only reason I continue to get together for coffee with my skeptic friend, because I don't enjoy it. He's so anti-intellectual. He's insulting. He's condescending. He has no formal education. And he's always telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm like, oh, I But at the end of every coffee, he goes, this was great. Let's do it again. I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? Why would you want to do this again? So that to me is an open door. If, if he didn't feel that way, I wouldn't probably keep pursuing him because there's other people I could reach out to. It's a great question. Yeah, basically, ask the Lord, should I continue to try with this person or not? Questions over here before the adults take the next one. Anyone? Teenagers, come on. Don't be afraid. I know I'm tall. I'll sit down. How's that? When I teach my college classes, sometimes students will sit in the back all semester. Then at the end of the semester, they'll come up to ask me a question. They'll be like, oh, Dr. Farnham, you're so tall. Like, we've been in the class together all semester. I haven't grown, except this way. Teens, questions? All right, we'll take one more from over here if there's any. If not, I've gone way past when I said one more here. Oh, okay. What about um, when they want to take it completely always to abortion or a social issue, and they really don't want to hear about Jesus? They don't yeah. want to know about anything. You know, they just want social questions answered. Yeah. When, whenever someone tries to take a conversation down a route that steers away from Jesus, by the way, the ultimate goal of my conversations is to answer questions, to get past obstacles so I can say, so what do you believe about Jesus? The goal is always to get to Jesus. This is why, some people aren't going to like this, I rarely ever talk about creationism in my apologetics. I'm a young earth creationist without, apolog without apologies, without apologetics, without apologies. But if I win them over to creationism and not Christ, they're still lost. So if a sticking issue for them is creation, I'll talk about it, but my ultimate goal is to get them to Jesus, to look at his claims. So if they want to get stuck in abortion, I'll probably turn and ask them questions. So why don't you think the baby in the womb is a human being? Why is it that when Meghan Markle got pregnant, the world was so excited about her baby? But when a woman wants to abort, it's not a baby. In other words, asking strategic questions will force them to look at the contradiction of their view and then say, you know, what I really want to talk to you about is Jesus. <laughs> And you might have to go back and forth about that, but I would definitely say uh, when it comes to social issues, I'll talk about it for a little while, um, but I, I want to show them, first of all, that their worldview can't, can't really support that. If you don't believe in God, if you're an atheist or a skeptic, you can argue all you want for this issue, that issue. You're just telling me your opinion. You like chocolate better than vanilla. In the Christian worldview, however, we can say injustice is wrong. And helping others and loving others, loving your neighbors yourself is good. So what you want makes sense in the Christian worldview, but in your worldview, it's a contradiction. Thank you for your time. Um, should I pray for the food down there? Right. Okay. Let's pray, and then I guess we're going to go downstairs. I'd be glad to talk more and answer questions. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful for the power of the gospel, for the fact that in Christ is all the wisdom of God so that every question that can be answered or asked, every challenge that can be raised can be answered ultimately in what you've done through Jesus Christ. And I pray that you'd give every person here boldness, that we would not cower in fear and avoid 
conversations, but that we would take the light of the gospel to the darkened world you've placed us in and that we would shine as bright lights that would draw others to the truth and to salvation. We pray now for our time of fellowship and food that you would bless it, that we might all continue to grow as we think and learn about how to engage unbelievers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.